The text for this morning is from the book of Philippians. I encourage you before the day is out to read the first nine verses. I'm going to read just one verse at this point from the text, but we'll refer to others as we proceed through the day. Paul says something very amazing. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. To be anxious is to be worried, to be stressed, nervous, apprehensive, fretful, and fearful. And when you hear those words, you're probably not prompted to offer a hearty amen, but rather a sarcastic, yeah, right. Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. Obviously, he had no idea the kind of world that we live in. Consider all of our reasons for anxiety. There is the Ebola pandemic, which has now touched our shores. 4,000 people around the world have died. There's the enterovirus that has affected kids in 43 states in our country. Children on our college campuses are disappearing, nowhere to be found. Just a few nights ago, there was a mass shooting on the streets in Richmond. The FBI chief warns that there is an impending serious terrorist attack. There are groups out there like ISIL or ISA or ISIS or whatever you call them this week who are cutting off people's heads. The Supreme Court punted on the issue of gay marriage. Unemployment remains much too high. In economics, we're dealing with inflation, stagnation, malaise. In politics, well, who even wants to talk about that? Religious institutions are in turmoil. Congregations are declining across the boards. It is said that 4,000 churches die, close their doors each and every year. There are conflicts within the churches that are stealing its life, its love, its passion, its ministry. We are dealing daily with sickness and illness, with injury, with suffering, with sorrow. We're spending far too much time, it seems, of late at funerals and in cemeteries. It's really bad out there. And Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. He obviously had no idea about the kind of world that we live in. Or did he? Let's look at some of the things that Paul had to deal with. He was put in prison over and over again. He was flogged an uncounted number of times. He faced death, literally, face to face with his own demise multiple times. He received 39 lashes from the Jews five different times, was beaten with rods on three different occasions, was stoned one time, was shipwrecked three times, spent a day at night floating in the sea, was in continual danger from robbers, was in danger from his own countrymen, was in danger from the Gentiles, was weary and often in pain, went many nights without sleep, was hungry and thirsty, cold and naked, had a debilitating eye illness that restrained restricted his ability to even write without an editor to serve him as a secretary. And if all that were not enough, he experienced personal attacks from fellow believers over and over again. As he wrote these very words that we looked at this morning, he was in a prison cell awaiting a trial that would result in his beheading. So facing all of this, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything. He's writing, by the way, to a church that is struggling. It is a small congregation. In fact, when you look at the New Testament and you read all of the letters that Paul wrote to congregations, most of them were much smaller than we are today. They had no property. 
They met in homes instead of a sanctuary. They had no money in the bank. They lived hand to mouth. They faced multiple of challenges. Even the church at Corinthians was struggling. Back in the very few verses of this chapter that we're looking at this morning, Paul says, stand firm. Now you don't advise people to stand firm unless they're being tempted to sit down and give up. We discover that there were two women in the church who were having a conflict. It was dragging the whole church down. Paul wrote to those women and to those around them that they find a way to be at peace. They were experiencing external persecution and they were being influenced by false teachings. And Paul writes to them in this situation and says, don't be anxious about anything. Now that's a fine platitude kind of cliched if you want to know the truth. We need more than simply the instruction not to be anxious. We need an answer to our anxiety. We need a solution. That's the number one challenge that is being faced today in the world. How does God speak to us in our anxiety? I know what that's like how difficult it is to deal with anxiety. I've spent many sleepless nights and frustrated days dealing with conflict, betrayal, false accusation, not being forgiven, financial stress, parental struggles, personal grief, the list goes on and on. It's not much different than your list, I know. I know what it's like to feel that anxiety, that sense of depression. I'm not alone on one prime time evening. I sat and watched television and noticed that there were five different commercials in prime time TV that were offering different drugs that you could talk to your doctor about to deal with your depression. <laughs> so we need an answer to our anxiety. We do. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, anything means everything. Don't be anxious, he says, at all. Then he gives us an answer. Now, for 21 days, I've been practicing the biblical solution to anxiety that I'm going to share with you today. I didn't begin 21 days ago thinking that I was going to offer a sermon about this. I didn't find it in a book. It turned out as I looked at the text this week that what the text said was what I was trying to do in my life. And I know that it's changing my life. I'm far less stressed. I sleep better. I have a bit more confident faith. I'm happier. I know what Paul means when he says, rejoice in the Lord always. My wife will tell you I'm not perfect, but I am a little bit better than what I've been. Still a work in progress. There are still moments. But I do believe that there is an answer to our anxiety. It's making a difference in my life. So I share it with you because I know it's a biblical answer from God that can make a difference in your anxiety. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in the good, the bad, and the ugly, when you're happy or when you're sad, have a mindset that's different. In every situation, have you noticed how addicting negativity can be? How insidious and deadly it can be? Are you one of those people who's ever been able to wake up in a morning when everything seemed bright and by mid-morning you had talked yourself into a terrible day? Before anything had actually happened that had gone wrong in your day, you had talked yourself into it by focusing on the potential bad. And have you ever noticed that when you focus on the potential bad, the potential bad becomes a reality? That's what negativity's greatest power is. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We need to nip, nip negativity in the bud. We need to flip the switch immediately when the emotions begin to fill our mind and heart. As soon as we start hearing that voice speaking to us, we need to begin by simply saying, stop. We cannot control the circumstances and situations of our lives. But we have been given by God the power to control our thoughts, our emotions, and our feelings. We need to command the negativity to stop. 
And then we need to go one step further in switching, this, in, in switching, making a switch to the positive. We need to do something to put our mind in a positive framework. I've taken to singing songs when no one else is around because I don't want to bring everyone else down. I've taken to remembering jokes. I've taken to remembering scenes in my life that make me happy. One of my favorite was the old Lucy Ricardo, I Love Lucy show. You remember that scene when the candy is coming off the conveyor belt faster than she can wrap it up and she's shoving it everywhere and I've always enjoyed that scene and every time I think about it, it puts me in a positive frame of mind. It makes me smile. Maybe that's what Paul's talking about in this text where he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything that is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, let me ask you a question. You answer it honestly in your heart. Is that the kind of stuff that fills your thoughts on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis? Are you thinking about what's true and noble and right and praiseworthy? We can choose to think the positive or the negative. Paul says to us in the book of Corinthians that we are to take every thought and make it captive and obedient to Jesus Christ. Do you take every thought and make it obedient to Christ? Well, that's step one. Reject the negativities. Stop the stinking thinking. Flip the switch from the negativity to the positive. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, he says. And then he says, in every situation, pray. That's step two. Talk with God about it. Now let's suppose it's a real world kind of challenge. We're having an interpersonal challenge with somebody at work or a family member. Somebody that's dragging us down. What do we do in those situations? We tell everyone how hurt and angry and frustrated we are. We tell our co-workers, we tell our boss, we tell our underlings, we tell our deacon, our teacher, our preacher, our best friend, our mama, our daddy, our sister, our brother, our children, the barber, the hairdresser, our neighbor. We tell everyone who will listen about our problems. Now what we think we're doing in those interpersonal conflicts is gathering allies, but really what we're doing is just spreading the negativity around. And does it make things any better? Of course not. So we keep broadening the circle, thinking that just one more is going to turn things around. I understand that sometimes we need a trusted counselor, but that doesn't mean that everyone needs to be our trusted counselor. I have been around long enough, involved in ministry long enough, to see this kind of thing destroy families, ruin lives, tear churches apart. Paul's talk is this, limit the conversation. In everything, if you have to talk to someone, the one you talk to is the one who can make a difference. Pray, he says. If you have to tell somebody else, why not begin with the person you have a conflict with? If somebody comes up to you and they have a gripe about someone else, tell them to go talk to that person. Don't allow yourself to be triangled into their mess. But it's not just the personal issues. In every situation. I've noticed this because I spend a little time on Facebook. That people will take whatever is griping them, whatever ailment or illness or struggle or situation they're facing, and they will whine and witch and complain about it all over social media. Don't tell everyone about all your aches and pains and struggles. Talk to God about them. He's the one that can make a difference. And as you do, as you talk with God, present your request to God. That's step three. Ask for God's help in dealing with the issues. Talk to God about your heartaches. Ask God for your help, his help and then trust God to provide it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, he says, with thanksgiving. That's step four. Be grateful. 
Be grateful. Offer thanks to God. We live with such negativity. And when we do, we advance our anxiety. When we live with the negativity, we forget all the many ways that God has blessed us. I've got a new phone. I don't even know if I can get it off my belt buckle here. I've got a new phone because the other one was being held together by tape and a prayer. So I had no choice to get this uh, new phone. It's one of those smartphones. I know it's smart. It's smarter than I am. It can do all kinds of things. But one of the things that's been a help to me is that, and my kids and my wife wondered, why, why, why does your phone seem to ring every three hours? It does. At 9 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, at 9 o'clock. I've set a timer. And when I hear that little buzz, the reason it's there is to remind me to program Thanksgiving into my day. So I'll say a prayer, or I'll list a few things that I'm grateful for, or I'll look outside and smile for no reason whatsoever except that I know that I'm loved by God. Or I'll pick up the Bible and read a passage of Scripture that encourages me and inspires me. I have programmed into my day a reminder to be thankful for God's blessings. And as I've done that, I begin to make a list. And I realize God has been so incredibly good to me that I need to remember that and praise him for it. And as I do, it's hard to be negative. As I do, it's hard to be anxious because I see all of the provisions that God has made for me in my life. Do you want God's answer to anxiety? First step, control your thoughts. Nip the negativity in the bud. Second thing, talk to God. Not everyone else. Talk to God about it. And as you do, number three, present your request to God. And number four, be thankful for God's blessings. And there's one more. Learn to relax. To rest. To release. That's my favorite word these days. Paul says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, all logic, all reason, the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you've talked to God, when you've given God your request, when you've offered God your praise and thanksgiving, then leave it in the hands of God. Let Jesus work his peace in your life. Let the peace of God guard, that's a military term, it means to keep watch. Let the peace of God guard your hearts, your emotions and feelings. Let the peace of God guard your thoughts, he says, that's your mind. Let the peace of God get your thinking right. Release. We clinch all of the things that weigh us down. Almost like a security blanket, except there's no security blanket in it. We clinch our anxiety. How many times in my ministry people have sat with me and said, I would love to be right with him, but I can't forgive him for what he's done. I will never forget what she did to me. Life is so hard all the time. That makes me so angry. There was one person in my first church while I was still in seminary. She was miserable, guilt-ridden, negative, anxious, stressed. She was 78 years old. One day I finally got up the courage to confront her and ask her, why was she always so negative? She told me that there was a lady in the church that she didn't like. And I said, why in the world I knew this lady? She seemed perfectly sweet and kind. Well, when she and this other woman were both 16, the other girl had stole her boy. Friend. I kid you not, 62 years later, she is angry and she didn't marry that guy, neither did the other one. They both had happy relationships with other men. They don't even know where that guy is today, but for 62 years, she had held a grudge and nursed that negativity and because of it, the two families that were represented by these two women were constantly in odds. I didn't know what to do when I stood up in front of this congregation. If I said one thing to one, I had to say something to another because it was a constant battle. There's some times we just need to let some stuff go. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, 
by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul's given us a clear, consistently biblical, consistent with everything I have read in psychology, everything I've read in counseling, an answer to anxiety. Control your thoughts. Nip the negativity and switch to the positive. We control our thoughts. You can do that. Talk to God, not everyone else. We can do that. Present your request to God in faith. Trust that God loves you and cares for you and knows what's best for you more than anyone else. Bring your burdens to him and trust him. Take time to praise. Offer thanksgiving to God for his blessings. And then, let it go. Release all of the stuff that's weighing down on you. Maybe just do it one thing at a time, one day at a time. Release it, relax, let it go. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our next hymn.